This video is sponsored by Bank of Texas. You start each day committed to pursuing better for your employees, clients, and communities. The team at Bank of Texas shares that spirit. We come in every day ready to fuel growth in North Texas and financial success for our clients. Our breadth of services and advice-driven approach allows us to compete nationally. But our deep connection to this community, our community, keeps us focused on being good partners. Well, thank you so much to Trek and also Chairman Mike Geisler for having us today, and also thanks to you incredible panelists that we have. Each of you are broadly well-versed in world affairs, and each of you have your geographical specialties. We could talk about a variety of issues today that are impacting the world, such as the global economy and supply chain, AI and cybersecurity, uh, climate issues, global migration and dis displacement, or the recent abundant activity in Africa and South America. Additionally, about half of the world, more than ever before, and including some of the most populous countries in the world, are electing their leadership this world, uh, this year, which will be consequential to our futures ac across the globe. But Ambassador Jordan, here in the middle, you left for Saudi Arabia to take up your post heading the U.S. mission there. About a month after 9-11, you have deep knowledge of the Middle East. You're currently diplomat in residence at SMU's Tower Center and most importantly served on the board of the World Affairs Council up until recently when you uh, reached your term limit. So thank you very much again for that. Admiral Walsh, you are a retired four-star admiral who last served as the 59th commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet towards the end of a distinguished 34-year naval career and now head college prep school Cristo Rey as the president. And David, closest to me, you are a leading expert in Russia and Ukraine. You served in the George Bush administration and at the State Department. You've been sanctioned by President Putin several times. And you were a main player in helping push the uh, Russia-related Majinsky Act through Congress. So I'd like to focus on these three, uh, the geopolitics of these three regions today as they seem to be the world's most pressing issues that are occupying the news and as I'd imagine, many of our brains the most right now. With everything going on, I can't think of a more important time for American leadership. Ambassador, yesterday National Security Council spokesman John Kirby said a coalition was still, quote, in the works, and they were working through options, after three U.S. troops in Jordan were killed by what appears to be Iran-backed militants. And at a press conference, Secretary Blinken said, we do not seek conflict with Iran. We do not seek war with Iran, but we have and we will continue to defend our personnel and to take every action necessary to do that, including responding very vigorously to the attack that just took place. What's at stake here? There's a lot of complexity in this situation. So what's holding in the balance that some of us may not be thinking of? I think we've got to remember uh, that this is likely going to be a long struggle. So the immediate aftermath of the uh, loss of uh, three uh, brave soldiers uh, in Jordan uh, is not the end, but part of the process of war, uh, part of the process of uh, dealing with a, uh, an adversary. Uh, so the tactics that are used right now in response to this immediate attack are part of a, a larger game plan, if you will, uh, in which we expect further attacks down the line, uh, potential further escalation. But it's like threading a needle. You've got to have a firm enough response that your adversary pays a cost for this. And at the same time, you don't want to start a conflagration, a war with Iran, uh, certainly not at this stage. And so we've got to think, what's in our national interest here? 
my guess would be a response uh, somewhere in Syria or Iraq against Revolutionary Guards uh, positions uh, would be likely uh, a response at this point. But it's not going to be a, a, a total deterrent. We're going to see more of these. And so I think we have to understand there's no magic bullet right now that will simply shut these people down. Uh, but it's partly the process of diplomacy, uh, working with our allies to garner uh, a coalition uh, that is stronger than the one we have right now, and anticipating several steps down the line. So, so obvious, Liz, uh, if yes, I could, please, Pat. You know, I used to live in the Middle East uh, shortly after Bob's time. I lived in Bahrain, and, and this issue with Iran has been around for a long, long time. I think it's important to unpack what the Secretary was saying, uh, because uh, the, it, the key themes behind it, Bob supports, and successive administrations support. And I think for the benefit of the audience, it's important to know why. If you, if you look at just polling data inside of Iran, what you find for the majority of the 40 million or so people who live there is that they are Western-oriented, Western-leaning, pluralistic in their view, and accept Israel as a nation state. And the last thing we want to do is alienate those who are on our side with strikes that would go into population centers in Iran. The real issue since 1979 has been the mullahs. This issue of authoritarian regimes that have strangled um, liberal ideas, free economies, open markets, all of that, under the control of a, the a theocracy, that's the real issue. So to go after the IRGC, to go after some of the satellite and the proxy nations, we've been dealing with this for a long time, whether it's Hamas or Hezbollah. So let's take it a step further. Obviously, the world's continents and regions aren't monolithic, but Ambassador, if you are Middle Eastern, let's say Saudi Arabian, Admiral, if you're Japanese, David, if you are the EU, what is your perspective on what's going on in the Middle East right now? Well, the perspective is, is one in which I think you, you say it, 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 will, it can't get worse until it gets worse. Uh, it is a, a spiral right now. You have, particularly with the Israel-Hamas uh, conflict, uh, two societies that don't believe the other really has the right to exist. Uh, that's a national narrative and a cultural narrative that is almost impossible to overcome in the short term. It's generational in terms of how it's got to be dealt with. Uh, at the same time, I think there's reason to hope that some of our allies in the region, like the Saudis, the Emiratis, and even Qatar, uh, have a role to play here uh, that needs to be accentuated. Qatar, for all of our concerns about their hosting uh, leadership of Hamas, also has a pipeline to Iran. They are business partners in natural gas production, uh, and they are in many ways an honest broker. And so we have these opportunities to cultivate these relationships uh, that will be important to us down the line. It's also very important to remember that the rest of the world is watching what goes on in the Middle East as well. Uh, China, for example, is paying close attention. Uh, Admiral Walsh is, is uh, by far an expert on that. But we're, what we're seeing is China would like to see the U.S. and Israel uh, lose their international stature, particularly among the global south. And so I think we've got geopolitics at play in almost every corner of the world affected by what goes on in the Middle East. Admiral? If you look at the world we were in when we lived in the Middle East and the world that we're having to deal with today, there's one significant difference that is uh, worth mentioning. We used to deal with these issues uh, with individual countries with a coalition. So we would deal with Iran, we would deal with the, the terror issue, with a coalition of countries that would be focused on some of these groups. Uh, Russia was in decline, China was ascendant, North Korea was a rogue player that was uh, just an arms exporter and, um, and work in the black market. Today, the unfortunate part is there is now closely, uh, moving closer together, a loose alignment with all these four 
nations in ways that we could have never imagined before. Yeah. So you have North Korea supporting the, the, the Russian effort. You have China in the background that is uh, working closely with Russia. And you have now um, the potential of, of a, an alignment of countries that we haven't seen before, and that's very problematic. All of our friendly nations are, are looking for whether they hedge their bets on the continued sustained leadership of the United States or not. Because at the end of the day, they live in the neighborhoods they live in, and they've got to deal with those countries. David, the EU. Uh, well, first, Liz, thanks for uh, letting me be part of this, and my thanks to Trek, and it's great to be with the ambassador and the admiral here, and uh, great to see all of you. Um, the EU, I think, is panicked about the situation in the Middle East because the EU is struggling with the situation in Ukraine. And the EU is hoping that the United States will take a leadership role on this, but I think is worried very much about the troublemakers, and that's to be diplomatic in describing the regime in Iran, in Moscow, uh, even in Beijing. And the hope, I think, is that the United States will find a way to tamp down the tensions. I don't think that's likely or possible in the near term, particularly based on what the two of you have just described. But I think the EU is worried about where we, the United States, are in all of this, worried about what's happening uh, in the Congress these days, um, and worrying about the sustainability of U.S. leadership whether it's in the Middle East, in the Asia Pacific, or on the European continent. One word, yes or no. Are we in World War III? No. Not yet. No. No, not yet, no. OK, so what action could provoke the US to go on the offensive and eventually join the war? Assuming the likelihood that they are not, we're not going to be attacked on US soil, what locations or actions could provoke that uh, us to go into war? Uh, maybe I'll start, because in, in the area I focus on, uh, to me, it, it would be an attack against a NATO member state. Uh, that would trigger Article 5, which says that an attack on one NATO member is considered an attack on all. And President Biden has been crystal clear that the United States will protect every inch of NATO territory. And so should the Russians move militarily into one of the Baltic states or against Poland, that I think would trigger a military response. The other would be um, use of a tactical nuclear weapon in Ukraine. I think the chances of that are extraordinarily low. In, for many reasons, one of which is that Chinese uh, leader Xi has made it clear to Putin that use of a nuclear weapon would be unacceptable. But we have also indicated to the, Chinese, uh, to the Russians, rather, to Putin, that should he use a tactical nuclear weapon, we will respond militarily, not necessarily with a nuclear weapon, but we will hit some Russian targets, and so that could lead to further escalation. Again, I want to be clear, I don't buy into the notion that if Putin pushed into a corner, we'll use a nuclear weapon. I don't think he will, nor do I think the Russian generals would sign off on such an order. But that would be a scenario where you could see uh, military escalation. Just to follow up, I think in the Middle East, it is much less likely that we would see a, a, an immediate triggering event. You could envision a scenario, though, uh, where Israel decides to take out Iran's nuclear capacity, particularly as they edge closer to a nuclear bomb. Uh, you can see some follow-on effects if uh, uh, there are uh, major losses on the battlefield uh, in which Iran then decides to cut Hezbollah loose. They've got 150,000 rockets aimed at, uh, aimed at Israel. Uh, and then you have the danger of a miscalculation, and I think this is where uh, Admiral Walsh has certainly seen a lot of this uh, over time uh, as well. Uh, skirmishes in, uh, in the Persian Gulf, in the Bab al Mandem Strait, uh, close quarters and uh, amped up uh, soldiers and sailors uh, can lead to something that is not intended, but then how do you, how do you stop it after that? I think that's a, a, a risk that is not inconsequential. Yeah. 
Yeah. So Dave. remember, we're looking through the lens of technology to evaluate the intent of the other guy. And if you, if you look in September of 1964, um, Turner Joy and Maddox got underway to collect intel passively. That, that was the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. So what happened is they were right at the um, territorial sea limit of North Vietnam. North Vietnamese sent torpedo boats out. Uh, the Turner Joy and Maddox saw torpedo boats coming to look at them and, and fired warning shots from 10,000 yards. A warning shot from 10,000 yards, five miles, means that someone shot at you and missed. So, uh, you know, North, uh, North Vietnam engages, and, and at that point, we have a war that takes 58,000 lives and lasts um, a long time for us. Yeah. You know, David, you mentioned China, so I'd like to pivot to Asia and Admiral. Uh, Taiwan held the world's first big election of the year, and a pro-autonomy candidate won as president, but his party lost the majority in parliament. Howard French in Foreign Policy recently said, it's the rare sort of thing in today's world that pleases both the United States and China. So how does this change the calculus for China, or does it? And as a follow-on, uh, President Biden has said that the U.S. will defend Taiwan militarily uh, in the case of a Chinese invasion. Admiral, how likely are you thinking that we will see a Chinese invasion of Taiwan in the next three years, let's say? Yeah, uh, if you define invasion as in um, all sort of spheres of the battle space, that could happen in cyber. That could happen in cyber as it is today very easily, uh, rather than to be the big amphibious landing that most people are thinking about. So the DPP remains in power. President Tsai is in power until May of, of this year. Um, and her successor, her vice president, uh, sees a continuation effectively of the, of the same sort of thinking when it comes to uh, mainland China. Remember, Hong Kong was very instructive for Taiwan. So when the Chinese crack down on, on Hong Kong, Taiwan's looking at that and go, I, I don't think that's the model that we have in mind. And, and so even within the progressive party, it created an anti-communist sort of view that now Taiwan is very, very strong and firm in terms of their position with regard to future relationships with the mainland. That is in conflict with the stated objectives of Xi Jinping, who has now publicly staked his reputation on the reunification of the China dream. And what does that actually mean? Well, that means in the next few years, we're gonna find out whether or not he intends to make good on that. But he's, he's publicly done something here that his predecessors have not. Previously, the Chinese approach, particularly the Communist Party approach in China, has been to hide their capability and bide their time. But with this regime, uh, he is not. He's revealed now what his true intentions are. And we are seeing very coercive language at sea. And we're seeing uh, intrusions into Japanese airspace and water space in ways that are very problematic and ripe for miscalculation. Last November, North Korea left the Comprehensive Military Agreement, which was designed to reduce tensions. Is North Korea's Kim Jong-un's progressed recent actions and statements emboldened by his partnership with Russia? And how concerned should we be about this escalation and the potential of an accident or miscalculation? I mean, how great of a threat really is North Korea right now? So the answer is yes, we should be concerned. Uh, yes, he is emboldened by his relationship with Russia that he didn't have previously. Previously, it had all been with China. This is the loose alignment that I'm most concerned about when you, when you stack Iran, North Korea, China, Russia together, yeah. now working you know, in the black market to support each other. That's very problematic. But remember, uh, the North Korea challenge and problem is not in isolation. The countries that live in the neighborhood are not standing still. And, and so what you'll see is an escalation in arms uh, and procurement for weapons in the region which now increases the likelihood of a miscalculated event. Can I, can I please, just pick up please, on please, what please. Pat said? Um, 
the, the Russia-North Korea relationship and China as well is a very problematic one for us. It is also a reflection, however, of Putin's isolation in the world. Um, yes, the global south has not come on board with sanctions against the Russian regime for its invasion of Ukraine, but when Putin has to rely on North Korea and Iran in particular for military assistance, that's a sign of how desperate, in some respects, Russia has become. Um, without Iranian drones, I would dare say that Russia's campaign against Ukraine would have suffered much greater setbacks than we have seen. Um, the North Korean relationship is dangerous because you have regimes in Moscow, Pyongyang, Tehran, Beijing that don't care about human rights. And this is what unites them in a common way. And they view the United States and the West as enemies. And so creating this chaos in the Middle East, creating uh, the disturbing scenes we're seeing uh, from the Houthis and elsewhere, this is what these regimes want. They're trying to upset the global order that has been in place for decades. And we have to recognize that we are at a grave point, not at World War III, but we are at a pretty grave point right now. So to, to continue the great point discussion, David, I want to talk about the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, what does victory look like now for Ukraine? It's a lot more complicated, I would say, than it was uh, just a few months ago. Um, let's remember, Russia didn't invade Ukraine for the first time in February of 2022. It invaded Ukraine the first time in February of 2014. This was after an anti-corruption, pro-Western, pro-democracy revolutionary movement in Ukraine that led the pro-Russian president, Viktor Yanukovych, to flee to Russia. And uh, an interim government came in, and Putin decided it was time to seize and illegally annex the Crimean Peninsula. Uh, he then tried his luck in the, in the Donbass region, the eastern part of Ukraine, and that, this war has been going on since 2014. More than 14,000 Ukrainians were killed as a result of that invasion until 2022. Um, and what we have seen since February of 2022 is a full-scale invasion by Russian forces. When Putin thought he would take over Ukraine, decapitate the Ukrainian leadership led by Volodymyr Zelensky, and uh, take over basically the entire country. That didn't happen, of course, thanks to the heroic efforts of the Ukrainian people and then assistance from the West. But it has created, I would argue, the gravest security crisis on the European continent since World War II. It has also been the scene of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and I would even argue genocide committed by Russian forces against the Ukrainian people. Let's remember that Putin has been indicted by the International Criminal Court for the illegal abduction of Ukrainian children to Ukraine. He could have been indicted, in my view, for many other war crimes. So this is a huge challenge. One, and the reason it has become much more complicated is because of the holdup on the vote for supplemental assistance, not just for Ukraine, but for, for Israel, for the Indo-Pacific, as well as for the border. And we, we were just talking before we came up here, it is not looking promising that the Congress will approve what would be $60 billion in assistance for Ukraine. I would argue, and I'll end with this, sorry, Liz, is that this assistance that Congress is going to vote on, thumbs up or thumbs down, will be the difference between Ukrainian victory and Ukrainian defeat. The Ukrainians are going to fight no matter what. The question will be, are we going to provide them the assistance, not our forces, but the military means by which they can succeed? Okay, so saying that they're going to fight no matter what, is it in Ukraine's best interests to negotiate now or risk President Trump getting reelected, who has said he'll end the war in 24 hours? Yeah, the 24 hours thing, I, I think no one takes all that seriously. Um, the Ukrainians should not negotiate in consigning millions of Ukrainians under Russian control. I, I think this push that we have seen and heard for months, not just in the past few months, but going into last year and the year before, 
that Ukraine should make territorial concessions to the Russians. They should give up Ukrainian territory. They should accept that they'll never get back Crimea or parts of the Donbass. That's easy for people in the West to say. They're not living under Russian control, where Russia engages in war crimes and crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing. Uh, the, the Ukrainian people do not support territorial concessions. They do not support negotiations with Putin, for good reason. Putin does not abide by a single agreement or treaty or memorandum going back to 1994, the Budapest Memorandum, uh, that Russia has, has signed on to. So in my view, no, uh, now is not the time for negotiations, and we should not consign millions of Ukrainians or Ukrainian territory to uh, Russian control. It won't bring peace in the long run. It will just give Putin an opportunity to rebuild his military. I open this up to any of you. What are the implications on our Western democracy if the Republicans can't get border funding pushed through and thus the next Ukraine funding doesn't go? And global order, writ large. Well, you'll certainly see some of our competitors around the world saying this shows that democracy doesn't work. Uh, they will say it's, an, it's time for a strong man, someone to come in who can actually make decisions order things that are clearly understood and clearly executed. Uh, and so I think it does uh, create uh, doubt around the world about the capacity of a Western-style democracy like ours. And I think that's something we've got to uh, bear in mind. I think it also uh, calls into question what a commitment from the United States actually means in execution. So you could look at the exit from Afghanistan, or you could go back to the, the agreement for security in Ukraine that we signed on to. And, and so what sort of obligations does that incur for us? And I'll just add to it that the, the world is watching what we do, what we are going to decide to do. And if we want to reduce the chances, I think, of a Chinese move against Taiwan militarily, one of the best ways to do it is to support Ukraine. Taiwan is among the biggest supporters of Ukraine because they recognize that trying to push Russia back will send a signal to Beijing and force Xi to think twice before he might uh, move ahead against Taiwan. The Iranians are watching what we do in Ukraine. Um, so our response to the Ukraine situation, I think, will have a major impact on how these other regions play out as well. Admiral, you mentioned commitments. Uh, so let's talk about commitments to our partners. President Trump has said many times that if he becomes president again, the U.S. will pull out of NATO. What should NATO do to prepare for Trump 2.0? Is Europe ready to assume a greater role? And what do you do if you're Japan and, or Israel? Uh, any one of you would welcome your comments. Well, look, what, look, at, look at where we are today with with the role that NATO has played. You know, the longest standing alliance in history. And, and look at the, the, the toll it has taken on Russian forces. I mean, it's not like we are actively engaged with our own forces there. I mean, we have armed Ukraine to fight. I don't know if we've armed them to win. That would be yeah, an interesting debate in yep. itself. But, um, but the role that the alliance has played and the cost associated with leadership, I think, is what, what uh, Mr. Trump is talking about. So let's just get that on the table. It's very expensive to lead. But look at the cost of withdrawal. Look at the vacuum it creates. Look at the world that we want. I mean, we're all tired and weary of national security issues, international security issues. But look what happens when we're absent from those conversations and we're absent from a leadership position. We are, in, <laughs> we are the only country particularly in the Middle East, that could lead a coalition. So when you look at countries in the Indo-Pacific region, um, they look at us. They don't look at each other. They want us nearby. They don't necessarily want us in their ports, but they want to know that we're a reliable partner. If we lose that ability to be reliable, dependable to countries that look up to us and need us, then democracy loses. And the whole rule of law concept which was put in place after millions of lives were upended at the end of World War II, and seven decades of leadership. That's all at stake, because the rules-based system, as we understand it, China wants, and they agree to, except with their rules. They're very clear about that. 
You know, Congress just passed a bill that said the president can't unilaterally pull out of NATO unless there's two-thirds approval by Congress or there's a Congress legislation around it. Yes or no, do you support that? And currently, by the way, it's sitting on President Biden's desk. But yes or no, do you support that? Strongly, yes. Strongly, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And, and can I just say, Please. Liz, um, there's a misconception out there that we are bearing the entire burden of helping Ukraine. That's fundamentally wrong. The Europeans actually are now providing more assistance in dollars than the United States. We are providing more military assistance, I think for, for natural reasons. Um, but the Europeans have stepped up in part because they are worried about whether we will be there uh, when, when the debate ends in the Congress. Um, the, the situation is such that if we don't help Ukraine, as I said, they will keep fighting but they are going to get slaughtered worse than they already have. They are fighting for their freedom, for their lives, for their land, and the Russians are the ones who invaded their country. This is, in my view, about as black and white a case as you can find, where Putin invaded again for the second time in February 2022 for no reason whatsoever other than he thought he could destroy Ukraine. He doesn't like that Ukraine is more democratic than Russia. He doesn't like that Ukrainians, by significant majorities, want to join the Euro-Atlantic community. He views all that as a threat to his rotten, corrupt, authoritarian system that he oversees. And so he wants to, he, he's not a builder, he's a destroyer. And if we don't stop that, then we are going to rue the day. Um, we, we said never again. Uh, after the Holocaust and World War II, and here we are, unfortunately, and uh, the question is going to be, is the United States going to do the right thing? Our, our assistance to Ukraine is about 3% of our Pentagon funding, our, our military budget. Um, as, as Pat said, we are not sending our forces to fight in Ukraine. The Ukrainians have not asked us to send our forces to fight in Ukraine. They do need our military assistance, however, and as you said, the, the assistance we've been providing, the, the way the Ukrainians have been providing, has destroyed arguably more than 50% of Russia's military conventional capability. And so we are getting tremendous return on this, thanks to the blood and sacrifice of the Ukrainians. And to let them down now, to me, would be unconscionable, frankly. Well, to take it further, what's the likelihood that Russia is going to invade in the nearish future another NATO country, what country do you think it will be? And then also, if that was to happen, Turkey and Hungary, who are NATO member countries, as we know, how do they turn or change, if at all? Well, I'll, I'll just start real quick. If Putin is defeated in Ukraine, and let me, let me define what defeat is, driving every Russian soldier off of Ukrainian territory and then holding Russia accountable for the war crimes. And then the last part of this is taking Russian assets over $300 billion in Western financial institutions, not just freezing them, which we've already done, but seizing them and providing them, making them available to the Ukrainians so that the Russians never get those funds back. Why should all of us, our, our Western societies, pay for the damage Russia has done in Ukraine. The Russians should be paying for this. Um, I, I think if Russia is defeated in Ukraine, they will not invade another country. But if we do not stop Russia in Ukraine, I think probably more vulnerable than a NATO member state is Moldova. Yes. And, and they're already stirring up a lot of trouble in Moldova, which is a tiny country just south of Ukraine that I have spent um, more time in than I want to remember. <laughs> Any other countries that you think would be included? Well, you've got Finland and Sweden, of course, who are new members, and yes. I think uh, they've got to be quite nervous. They share a very long border with Russia, and Russia is very unhappy that they've joined NATO. They're I think, already, uh, uh, I yes. think Taiwan reevaluates mm, yeah. uh, the yeah. commitments from the West yeah. and, and tries to understand what does this mean to me. And, and I think what it means to Taiwan is that if, if the West shows weakness with this black and white situation as clear as it can be, um, then I'm sure they're, they're second guessing now their relationship with the United States. So again, Admiral, you mentioned commitments. So in our polarized nation, uh, that's represented by views diametrically opposed on how to engage the world, how can our allies count on us as a partner and for any of you? 
there's a real question as to whether they can. And part of it is our cycle now of polarized uh, elections every two to four years. Uh, the House swings, the Senate swings, the presidency swings. Uh, and uh, you certainly hear anecdotal comments uh, from, uh, constantly uh, that our allies aren't sure which America shows up at, at the bargaining table the next day because policy changes so dr uh, dramatically. It used to be even uh, when we changed the presidency that our foreign policy was generally a, a consensus-driven uh, enterprise, but that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. Uh, and in some cases, you've got uh, members of Congress saying, let's not do X or Y because it will make it hard on the president uh, or the administration as opposed to what's best for the country. And that's, this is something relatively new to at least be this, uh, this much out in the open. I was in Tokyo two weeks ago. They're asking the same question. Yeah. They, want it, they want us to explain our domestic situation. And what did you tell them? <laughs> uh, I actually, actually wanted to hear their opinion because <laughs> I think they had a pretty good understanding of it. Yeah. 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 I want to go, please, can, can please, I say please. One, one quick thing. Um, isolationism is a dirty word in my view. Um, we are the world's leading power in that we lead by our example, by our commitment to democracy and human rights, also peace through strength. It's incredibly important to show that we will be there with our allies in their time of need. And for those who think we can just wall ourselves off by our two oceans on each side are tragically, terribly mistaken. Um, if, if we think we can just pretend that all that other stuff over there is somebody else's worry and business, we will pay a, a major price in the end. And we will wind up paying a lot more to try to fix it if we do that. A quick round robin uh, round. One ally, who in the world, one ally is our most important ally? Japan. Agree with you, okay. UK. UK. Hmm. It could wind up being Ukraine yep. if we help them. Uh, think about the cost they're bearing right now to defend freedom. Um, and if we help them, I think we will find no better ally. In three words or less, what's the thing that keeps you most up at night? Miscalculation. Miscalculation. Division within our own society. Division within our own society. Agree with Bob, and I would just add dysfunctional, uh, yeah. dysfunctional system. Dysfunctional systems. Uh, in three words or less, uh, what's the thing that makes you most hopeful? American democracy. American democracy. Uh, three words or less, you said? <laughs> Crickets. Universal yearning for freedom, that's four. Yes, universal yearning for freedom. Admiral? People. People. The investments we make in people, as long as we continue to do that, then, then there is hope and there is a way forward. I have one last question, but you're the president of Cristo Rey, the That's college the prep school. Do you I want to talk that. about that for a second? Yeah, so my story is from the Pacific to Pleasant Grove. I, I am in a zip code where the median income is 33,000. Kids are tied to the federal poverty line that come to our school. We have 500 students, and they're all going to college. We teach college prep. We have AP courses. Half our students are in AP courses, and our students work with 125 partners here in Dallas, including many that are in the audience. They get a chance to see leaders in action from the business community, and they graduate with a transcript and a resume. Mm -hmm. On average, they get eight or nine offers, and this is a zip code that's invisible to most of Dallas. You want a hubcap, I can get you that. You want a muffler, I can get you that. <sighs> Whole Foods, no. So I'm excited about the future because of what I see in Pleasant Grove. Please get them involved in international affairs. Sincere okay. request. Uh, I have one last question, and then we're going to open up to this uh, wonderful group here. So 
how does what we've talked about today in this conversation impact those here in this room, those that may do business internationally, those that work in commercial real estate, et cetera? Why does it matter? Uh, free democratic countries are reliable partners, better trade uh, partners. They don't cause wars with us. They, don't, they can disagree with us. Um, and we can have friendly disagreements, but it is in our interest to support democracy and freedom around the world because that will make for a more secure, stable, and prosperous future for all of us. There's a, uh, a notion that we have no existential threat looking at us right now. I think that's false. I think the existential threat is uh, insidious and it's creeping. Uh, and totalitarianism, uh, authoritarianism, uh, empire building uh, among our adversaries uh, is a threat that can affect the quality of life of every single person in this room, uh, from raising the price of oil to $200 a barrel, uh, to interest rates, uh, to your livelihood in commercial real estate, whatever it is, <clears throat> it can be affected uh, by malevolent actors uh, on the world scene. Conflict is in every domain. So it's not just on land, in air, um, or at sea. It's also in space, it's in cyberspace. And what that means is the challenges that we have are far more complex, as Bob was talking about. And the solutions require um, solutions between the public and the private sector. That's, that's where real solutions can, can come from that have uh, a chance of having an impact. So actually, you mentioned existential threat, uh, Ambassador. So let me just ask one last question to you, please. Uh, the U.S. has pushed for a two-state solution in Israel, and recently Prime Minister of Israel Netanyahu has seemingly ru ruled out the avenue as it would constitute, quote, an existential danger to Israel. So is a path a t to a two-state solution actually feasible? Well, first of all, my guess is Prime Minister Netanyahu will not be around uh, that much longer. His political career is coming to a close, uh, given uh, many of the events we've observed. Uh, secondly, uh, a two-state solution is really the only answer to this uh, millennial-long uh, struggle between these two cultures. There has to be a way for both cultures to live together in some kind of peace. It's not going to be perfect or convenient for either side, but they both claim uh, the same land and they claim the right exclusively. Uh, that just doesn't work. And so you've got to have a repository for the political aspirations of either side, or this is going to be a cycle that is an existential threat to Israel's uh, status as a, as a Jewish country uh, and its status as a democracy uh, going forward. So we're going to open it up to this uh, audience here. If you have a question, we'd love to hear it about anything. We've got what right in the middle here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, so Nixon was able to kind of pierce the Sino-Soviet um, alliance um, in the 70s. What, in your opinion, would be the best way to kind of break up this new adversarial axis? Uh, to me, it's, it's support for Ukraine, which will redound to Taiwan's benefit, which will redound to the benefit of our allies in the Middle East. I, I, I know I sound a little biased because this is the region I focus on, but to me, Ukraine is the focal point. And if we don't get this assistance passed, then I think we will feel the cascading effects throughout. Yeah, I, I think there are yeah. linkages there that may not be obvious to most, yeah. but I certainly see it the same way. Yep, yeah, same. There was one over here. Yes, question right here in the front. Uh, yeah, how accurate would it be to compare today's situation in Ukraine with Afghanistan's situation in the 70s, referring back to Nixon and all that time frame, and the way that the U.S. pulled out right at the integral part of creating infrastructure and what that's led to and Afghanistan's view of the U.S. now? Well, I'm not sure the parallels are all that accurate. Afghanistan was a situation where 
uh, several presidents had uh, forecast our withdrawal. Uh, the way the withdrawal occurred was uh, horrendously uh, botched uh, and handled in a really almost inexcusable way. Uh, but I don't see the, quite the parallel uh, with, with Ukraine uh, in that respect. Uh, we're, we don't have boots on the ground. We haven't had lives lost uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, but we have an opportunity in Ukraine uh, to actually show that we are a steadfast partner uh, uh, in some contrast to the way we uh, exited Afghanistan. What other questions do we have? Yes, in the back there. What are your thoughts on the Budapest Memorandum of 1994 under Bill Clinton and how that may have sealed the fate of Kiev? Sorry, the Budapest Memorandum? Yeah. Of 1994. Yeah. So th this was, uh, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, um, there were now four countries that had nuclear weapons, Russia, Kazakhstan, uh, Belarus and Ukraine. And the United States uh, in particular was very concerned about trying to consolidate control and possession of these nuclear weapons under Russian, uh, Russian control. The, we and the UK, along with Ukraine and Russia, signed this Budapest Memorandum, it was called. It's not a treaty, so it didn't uh, bring with it treaty obligations. But if you think about its significance, it's pretty extraordinary. Ukraine agreed to give up its nuclear weapons, surrender them to Russia, in exchange for guarantees by the other three signatories not to interfere in or invade Ukraine. And so this was the Budapest Memorandum of 19, 19, 1994 was cited during Russia's first invasion in 2014. But again, because it's not a treaty, it didn't obligate us to come to Ukraine's military aid, but um, th there are many Ukrainians who regret having given up uh, the country's nuclear weapons because they feel if they did still have them, Russia wouldn't have invaded in the first place. That could be argued, um, and I certainly don't support having Ukraine develop nuclear weapons now. It's also too late to do so. Um, but it is a reminder of, of the gravity of that memorandum and, and what was at stake and what Ukraine agreed to do and how the rest of us haven't really lived up to our obligations under it. I think they looked at us almost the way they would look at it as a treaty. Yeah, Meaning, yeah, they did. You know, with that agreement, there was a quid pro quo that if you give it up, that we will you know, help guarantee the, the security of Ukraine. And, and you know, with the invasion of Crimea, I don't, I don't think I remember hearing sort of tactical nuclear weapons in the rhetoric at the time, but certainly in the case of the 2022 yes. invasion, um, that became more of a threat. Exactly. Yes. How uh, do you balance the need for retaliation against Iranian-backed uh, militias without avoiding uh, an all-out confrontation with Iran? Balance, balance retaliation against Iran for what it did without uh, full scale, if I got it right. Yeah, without a full scale yeah. uh, confrontation sure. well, with Iran. The retaliation that I described earlier, I think, is probably where we're, where we're heading uh, for the moment, and that would be uh, targeted uh, attacks on uh, Iran Revolutionary Guards uh, outposts, uh, in some cases leadership, uh, Trump's uh, attack on Soleimani, for example, is an example also of, of uh, uh, something that is, uh, would, would shake Iran to their foundation uh, without having attacked them, uh, their soil. Um, but I think we've got to look at it again uh, in a continuum. This is not going to be the last attack we've suffered, and it won't be the last response uh, we undertake. And so we've got to find a way to calibrate it. Uh, and bear in mind that we're not going to have uh, a, a total submission uh, by Iran, but we need to raise their costs. And part of the, the, uh, the conflict management uh, side of this is imposing significant costs on your adversary without suffering uh, reciprocal costs on your own. And that's, that, that, that there's nothing uh, particularly uh, uh, unique about it, uh, but that's that, that's the way this this particular conflict I think is going to go for a while. 
Any other questions? Ladies, any questions? <laughs> Let me ask one last question, Linda, as, as you come up. Uh, yes or no, do you support the ascension of Ukraine into NATO? Yes, but we have to help Ukraine win the war first. Okay. Yes, in a measured sense. In a me yes, in a measured sense? Yes. Yes. And uh, quick, what do you think the timeline of that would be? And do you think Hungary's Prime Minister Orban would approve it? Uh, I think eventually he will. Zelensky and he is supposed to meet soon. And uh, I, I think the pressure on Hungary will be considerable to approve it. But if we, are, if we do not pass this assistance that's before Congress right now and help Ukraine win this war, I'm not sure the United States will support NATO membership. The Biden administration dragged its feet on this last summer during the NATO summit. It and Germany were the two out, outliers on this. And I worry that if Ukraine is not in a bad position, then we won't support it either. Yeah, we, we can't have an Article 5 obligation to a country that we've allowed to go down the drain. Yeah, agreed. So Putin has created the scenario that he wanted to avoid. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm.